because he's talking generally to the congregation. We are to submit to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. That means I take down to let you have your way. But then you take down to let me have my way. So in other words, we end up defeating everything in humility because we begin to prefer one another. He's talking to the congregation. He's not talking to the marriage situation. He goes, then he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. I hope it's your own husband. As unto the Lord, as unto the Lord in Christ's stead. If you, ought, you ought to serve your husband as if you are serving Christ. Because God says you are serving God when you serve your husband. This is what the Bible says. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject, verse number 24, unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. I know that my volume got louder when I started talking about wives submitting. Did anybody notice that? <laughs> Therefore, the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse number 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. I didn't go further into what men's obligation was because we weren't talking about marriage. We were talking about submission. We just had a little side journey about people who think they're being subject to God and they're causing hell in the house or being unsubmissive. You can't do that and claim you the prophetess and the apostolate and you're going to save the world and you're not subject to your husband at home. When you get married, mighty apostolate, you are still under the authority of your husband. If he say no preaching tonight, no preaching tonight. That's why you better look high and wide and find you somebody who can hear from God so that when you marry them, they won't be hindering the work of God. <laughs> Prophetess, apostolate, whatever. <laughs> Verse number 20, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, you know men love their bodies. <laughs> Feed them and do everything. <laughs> he that loves his wife loves himself. You find a man that doesn't love his wife properly, he got a security problem. He got an issue. He got some issues with himself. You know, you can only love people. The Bible says love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. A lot of problem with people is a lot of low self-esteem. And I don't know how you get low self-esteem because it's called self-esteem. You ought to be in charge of that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Verse number 29. For no man ever hated his own flesh but nourished it and cherished it even as the Lord nourishes and cherishes the church. That's the balance to that message. You ought to submit to your husband. That gives him, the, gives him the, as the head of this unit. Amen. But he's supposed to, in turn, lay his life down for you. Like Christ laid his life down for the church. Amen. You got you got some, of your, some, some folks marry some men that lay down everything else but their own life. Amen. And so there's a balance. You don't, brothers, you're not getting off the hook. That's right, submit to me. Well, this thing works two ways. Amen. He said, love him like Christ loved the church. Maybe you need a revelation of how Christ loves the church. That's what some people don't have a revelation of is what he what he's willing to do for the church. Amen. Then over here in first Peter three and five, it says, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Even Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Don't get mad at me. It's the Bible. Whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. In the same way, verse number 7, you husbands must honor, give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are physically, but she is the equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so that your prayers are not hindered. A lot of married people's prayers can't go nowhere because they're not submitted to each other properly. She's not under authority, and he's not giving honor to her. See, when you get married, you're no longer solo. It's no longer me, mine, and I. It's us, we, and ours. That's right. You marry somebody with bad credit, guess what's going to happen to your credit? Just like you marry somebody with money, you get money, right? It works both ways. You better look before you leap. 
Amen. Love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. Amen. So don't look at me. What are you talking about? I don't have to be married to tell you what the Bible is telling you is true. I can read. Amen. He said she called him Lord. In the Greek, it means master. Well, I'm not going to call no man. That's probably why you don't have one. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Either you're going to be a Christian, you're going to do it the way the Bible tells you to. And you ought to be prayerful before you marry somebody who's going to be overlord and over you, ruling over you. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus is a benevolent dictator. But he is a dictator. He don't come around and ask your opinion. He's going to tell you how it's going to be. That's what it's going to be. And it's going to be rebellion if you go against it. Don't look at me like that. People say, who wouldn't want to serve Jesus? People that don't want to be ruled. That don't want anybody telling them what to do. Jesus has to be the boss. And if he's submitted to Christ and you're submitted to him, it's supposed to fall in line and fall in order. God is not going to bless marriages that don't do this. You can confess the word, blab it and, cr- blab it and grab it, call it and haul it, profess it and confess it. It's not going to work because your prayers are hindered. Are you listening? 1 Corinthians 7 and 2, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. I know you got a bunch of deep spiritual reasons why you want to get married, but he said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband, verse number 3, render unto the wife due benevolence. Likewise, also the wife unto the husband. Huh? Listen, verse number four. For the wife does not have power over her own body, but the husband has it. Likewise, also the husband does not have power over his own body, but the wife. There's, a, there's an exchange of power here. There's a yielding to each other. If two people make up in their mind they're going to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, And the word of God is going to be the final say-so and authority over their life and line up with God's word. And then the, the wife submits to the husband and he loves her like Christ loved the church. When they do these things, we're not trying to use people. We start trying. It becomes, it's not who can get the best of somebody or get what they want. It becomes a contest of who can outserve each other. Who can look out for you? No, I got you. No, I got you. No, I got you. No, I got you. I said I got you. That's what folks start doing. They start getting mad. I said I got you. People get extreme. But that's how it's supposed to be in exchange. I don't have to look out for my needs because you're meeting them. And you don't have to look out for your need because I'm meeting yours. Beans and cornbread hand in hand. See, it just goes hand in hand. You don't know that song. It's too just past your time, see. That's way back, son, see. Don't look all sad faced it. Because look what he says next. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be for consent for a time, that you may be able to give yourselves to prayer and fasting, that's consecration, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for the lack of self control. I want you to understand something about the letter of Corinth. When he's writing, Paul is taking great pains to talk about fornication. He says, Every sin that is committed is committed apart from the body except for fornication. Fornication is the sin that is committed with the body. We say, what about adultery? Adultery is more of a sin of the heart because you're breaking a commitment that is internal and you're following through with sexuality. But really, fornication is unlawful, carnal knowledge of somebody that don't belong to you. In the Corinthian church, this is a fact historically, they, had, they lived in a city where there were brothels and prostitution was everywhere. And young men in the Corinthian church were saying, well, I'm not going to be, you know, married. So I just, I, I got to do something because in that culture, they believed that sexual activity was a necessity of life. And so they were going to the prostitutes to be serviced. So Paul had to go in and say, hey, you can't do that either. So this is why he starts addressing this subject. Are you listening? Because it's a highly promiscuous. He says, hey, you've got to understand the mystery of what's going on in marriage and why God created it. It's a covering for you in that area. If you can't, if you avoid fornication, get married. If you don't want to have sex, don't get married. And you act like that, that never happens. People get married all the time and don't want to do nothing. You need to just shake hands. Get out the Scrabble board, do some word puzzles, and forget about it. 
Because that is the expectatione. You hear me? Now, I didn't make this stuff up. This is what the Bible says. You know, the, the devil is turning our sons and daughters into whores. You see, the thing about why they thought prostitution was okay is because there's no emotional connection. It was a sexual, physical gratification, so they wasn't getting involved with him. So it was like a transaction, so it was just okay. And so this is what this country and these young people in this country are driven by, sexual gratification without any type of internal connection. No emotion, just all sex and that's it, like a cold transaction. And it turns people into whores because you desensitize yourself. That's why the pornography industry is running rampant. It desensitizes people to a reality of what the union that God created. And so it's proper understanding. Listen, right now there is a study that's been done several times. I'm getting ready to finish preaching about something else. I just had to cover. This was just a station identification. I had to clear that up for some of you folks that was mad last week. There's a study right now that says that America's turning into a man desert. That young men are opting out and don't want to get married because they don't see the benefit of getting married. They see more bills, more responsibility. They see more of everything that causes a weight and a bondage and less of the benefit. And they're opting out. They have men in Japan who they call them, I forgot the name, a whole culture of men who say they never get married. And they don't even want sex. They just give themselves to video games and other activities. Yeah. It's, starting, it's, all, it's not just here. It's all over the world. The devil wants to destroy family. Family is the thing that God, God instituted the marriage and then family. And then the church. That's it. Are you listening? Amen. So unless these men get a revelation and these women get a revelation about what it's about, you're going to see more of it. You just can't sit back and tell somebody, you ought to just do it because it's right. That ain't going to work with everybody. Are you listening? So this is what we're facing in this world. And I'm going to tell you something. I know a lot of people believe that God is going to drop somebody and God's going to send you somebody. I've seen people wait for 40, 30 years on God to send them somebody and nobody ever came. You're going to have to use your brain. God gives food. Don't God feed the birds? They don't take no thought, do they? God just drops, comes by and flies over and drops food in their mouth every day, don't he? No, that ain't true. They got that bird, got to get up there and go get that bird. Got to get that worm. But who, when he gets the worm and feeds him, what do we say? God fed him. Because God provided the source of food. And God gave him the ability to do it. Gave him the eyes. Gave him the claws. Gave him the wings. Gave him the, everything else. So it's a you and God working together. Not just all God or all you. It's both working together. Are you listening? I'll tell you something. If God was, now I don't believe God sends people to you. I believe there's presentations and, and people have a choice. Somebody don't want to don't want to go with it. Don't want to go with it. That if, if they decide they don't want to go with it, that don't mean that your life is over now because the only one you had was supposed to be that one, and they don't want to obey God. Don't that, that can't be? That don't make no sense. Because my experience is church folk don't obey God anyway half the time. What makes you think they're going to obey when it comes to marriage but not anything else? People can be disobedient against if, if God was saying, this is the one for you, you've got to have that one, and if it's not that one, then I'm sorry. God is dealing with people being disobedient all the time. I'm going to just say it like this. If God was to send somebody to you that would be godly, why would he subject one of his real sons to somebody who's irre irreverent and unsubmissive? with a bunch of unhealthy and ungodly ideas about what marriage and sex is supposed to be about. You wouldn't do it. Don't look at me like that. All right, I'm going to get off marriage because y'all lips are starting to get tight. Mm, I'm leaving this church, I know. I know. I don't really ever talk about it, amen. <laughs> well, back to the believer's story. Come on, say amen. <sighs> you can breathe right now. God's word, listen, God's word reveals that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against demonic powers. Finally, Ephesians 6, chapter 6 and verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, you know, the devil is wild. And <laughs> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we went through this extensively through study in the Bible, uh, Bible study during the week. The word wrestle, 
The word wrestle there means to try to uproot one, to throw them down and then tend them. 